Death at Gallows Green Chapter 7 The housekeeper must consider herself as the immediate representative of her mistress and bring to the management of the household all those qualities of honesty, industry and vigilance in the same degree as if she were the head of her own family. Constantly on the watch to detect any wrongdoing on the, on the part of any of the domestics, she will oversee all that goes on in the house. Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, 1888 Hurry along now, Harriet, Sarah Pratt said firmly, and don't dawdle, time's a wasting. Tea was over and there was the washing up to do, and the kitchen too tidy and ready for breakfast. While Miss Ardley was gone to Milford Hall to a house party, breakfast at Bishop's Keep was not the formal affair it was when she was at home. But it would not do to let things slide. Mrs. Pratt surveyed the newly appointed hall where the servants took their meals. While she still mourned the death of Elder Miss Ardley, she could say without fear of contradiction that the demise of Jaggers, the younger of the two Ardley sisters, had occasioned a great change in the management of the household. Now that the young miss was in command with herself, Sarah Pratt, at the helm, so to speak, the ship sailed along ever so smoothly. Her gaze lingered on the sofa that had been brought down from the attic, and ever so comfortably too. No more sugarless tea for the servants, and that made from sweepings the poorest to be had. No more stale buns either, but fresh buns with raisins, and she'd be given back the drippings to sell for her profit, as was her right. No penny pincher was the young miss. She had begun on good bottom, as the unfortunate Mr. Pratt would have said, and she was carrying on that way. There was in Mrs. Pratt's otherwise quite high esteem of her employer, however, one niggling apprehension. It was not that she was actually doing anything wrong, of course. The difficulty was that she held certain unconventional views as to the propriety of certain behaviours. She undoubtedly held these views because she was an American and not properly brought up, no disrespect intended. However the habit had arisen, Mrs. Pratt had to say that the young miss did not sufficiently concern herself with what other people thought. In particular, she did not worry about setting an example for the servants. And that was the pickle in which Mrs. Pratt found herself. Among other things, Miss Ardley was in the habit of riding a bicycle in the evening, on a Sunday evening while everyone else was at, was at even song, and with Constable Lincoln alone. In the minds of villagers, Mrs. Pratt heard this regularly from her sister Rose, Miss Ardley and the constable were a friendly couple. If Miss Ardley did not intend to marry the man, she was running the risk, the very definite risk, of appearing fast. And if she did intend to marry him, well, Mrs. Pratt had every respect for the constable. The match was not appropriate to Mrs. Artley's station. In her opinion, the young Marston heir, Bradford Marston, was a far better choice. Not necessarily a better man, mind you, for the constable had a kind nature and was indeed liked by all, while the future Baron Marston was something of a rake. But still, one was aware of the social realities even from the kitchen and it would present no end of difficulty if Miss Artley were really to prefer the constable. Not that any of this was Mrs. Pratt's business, of course. She was not a dragon of propriety. But what was her business was the discipline of the servants. And how was she to maintain a proper discipline, she'd like to know, if the mistress went riding with the constable alone, unchaperoned, until nearly dark? The servants, who knew as well as Mrs. Pratt what was going on, wouldn't stick at using such behaviour to excuse their own misdemeanours. If they used the mistress as a model of behaviour, who knew what kinds of cutting up they might get into? Mrs. Pratt's concern might not have been as so acute if it were not for the fact that the two of the servants, the coachman Pocket and Amelia, ladies maid to Miss Artley, were at a vulnerable age. To complicate matters, Amelia was Mrs. Pratt's niece, her only sister's second daughter, and Mrs. Pratt's worry was not without foundation. Amelia had come in that afternoon, her face flushed, the flounds on her skirt torn, her shoes dirty. She had washed up, helped with tea, and said a scarce a word, keeping her eyes on her work the whole while. 
By itself, this behavior might not seem of great consequence, but Amelia was not the first of Mrs. Pratt's nieces to have been in the service of Bishop's Keep, and therein was the genesis of Mrs. Pratt's uneasiness. Amelia's sister, Jenny, had been a parlor maid. Remembering Jenny, Mrs. Pratt's lips pinched together and she shivered. Jenny had been a foolish girl and pretty, but not half so pretty as her younger sister. Her foolishness was in the way of bearing sad fruit when the situation came to the notice of Jaggers, who had turned her out. Six months later, the Chelmsford constable had come bearing a little bundle of clothes. Jenny had died in the workhouse there, and she and the babe with her. It had been a bitter, bitter thing for Mrs. Pratt had felt in her soul that she was responsible for Jenny's misconduct. And now there was Amelia, who seemed to be following along the dangerous path of her sister, slipping and sliding to certain ruin. It was in this preoccupied state of mind that Mrs. Pratt finished clearing the dishes onto a large tray, including the pink and white pie dish, from which the household staff had eaten every crumb of a fine steak and kidney pie, and carried the tray to the kitchen, where she poured hot water from the kettle into the basin and began the washing up. While she did so, Harriet, the scullery, tidied the table, swept the floor, mended the fire, and brought in a scuttle of coal, pausing at the last to fill the large china teapot with boiling water for Mrs. Pratt's after-dinner cup. Mrs. Pratt was polishing the last dish when Mud came in and poured himself a cup of tea. "'Shall you have a cup too, Miss P?' he inquired. There was a more than usually thoughtful look on his thin face. Maud was only twenty-six, too young to be a proper butler, and had been, until a year before last, a London footman. Mrs. Pratt would have given a good deal to know why he had taken a place in the country far away from the enticements of city living, but so he had, and he had done modestly well. He was uncommonly intelligent, able to speak both the upstairs and downstairs dialect, an unusual ability that he used to clear to clear advantage with both servants and masters, and rather more contentious than most servants. Mrs. Pratt saw in him a clear promise. If he could keep his mind on learning to butler and cease fancying himself quite the dandy. I believe so, Mott. Thank you. Miss Pratt took off her apron and shook it, and then put it back on, clean, side out. As she took a mug of tea and sat down by the fire, Maud caught her eye and nodded significantly at Harriet, who was hanging up the pots. Mrs. Pratt took his meaning and nodded back. "'That'll be all for the night, lass,' she said. "'Tomorrow will be fish. If Willie Hockle's dog was, has a decent place in his cart, and you shall cook it.' Upon Jagger's demise, Mrs. Pratt had been promoted from cook to housekeeper. She still carried out most of the cooking duties, but Harriet, although young, was in training for the place. Whenever possible, Mrs. Pratt gave the girl opportunity to exercise responsibility. Harriet's face glowed. Thank you, Mrs. Pratt, she, sw she swallowed and then emboldened herself. May I, may I take a candle? I'd like to read. Mrs. Pratt's hesitation had more to do with the reading than the candle, for Jagger's passionate injunctions against novels still echoed in her ears as loudly as did the injunction against an open flame in the servants' sleeping quarters. It did seem to Mrs. Pratt that what was printed these days was mostly trash, full of murders and thieving and illicit affairs, and not morally fit for a young girl. But Miss Ardley had quite a different attitude. She had instituted daily periods of reading aloud for Harriet and the tweeny Nettie. They had begun with the newspaper, but the young Miss for Christmas had given each of them a book. To Nettie, a copy of Little Women, and to Harriet, Joe's Boys, both by an American woman named Olcott. Nettie had little interest in her book and soon laid it down, but Harriet, Mrs. Brad knew, stole a few minutes daily to pursue hers. She had finished it some weeks ago and was now reading Nettie's. Mott settled himself at the fire. Let her take it, he said, in a strong native cockney he used on the servants. Sire on, on the green baize door. Won't hurt her, I warrant. He twinkled up at Harriet, from for whom he was known to have a brotherly softness. As long as you don't burn the bloody house down, he added. Mrs. Pratt nodded, although with reluctance. The matter of novel reading had become quite vexed since Amelia's discovery in the young Mrs. Room of a sheaf of typed pages. It appeared to be a story that Miss Artley was in the process of writing. 
Amelia had spoken of her fine to Clara, the new parlourmaid, who had told Mrs. Pratt, and, and well she might, since it was Mrs. Pratt's responsibility to know what went on in the house. The story was entitled The Conspiracy of the Golden Scarab and appeared written under the name of one Beryl Bardwell, and a very sensational story at that. What's more, under the bed they found several other stories under the same name, all published in an American magazine. It was an unsettling discovery. Imagine, Clara had breathed excitedly as she flipped the pages in one of the magazines. Our young miss is famous. I wonder why she don't let her lights shine in the world instead of hiding under a bushel. She has a reason, I'm sure, Mrs. Pratt said evasively, although she did not think that the biblical quotation could be applied to what her mistress was about. And she could not for the life of her imagine why Miss Artley, with the fortune she had inherited, would spend her time hunched over a typewriter pecking out scandalous stories. But the young miss had stood for her when she needed a friend, and she'd stand for the young miss as long as need be. Although she had to admit the two have to reservations about novel writing and bicycle reading during even song. She pushed the magazines back under the bed. Stop gabbling and get your dust in. She told Clara sternly, and not a word of this business outside the house if you value your place. The next morning all the servants had been warned to hold their tongues, and all had pledged their solemn promise to keep Mrs. Artley's secret. The fact that Mrs. Pratt has, had not heard a whisper of it in the village proved that, what, that they had been true to their words. Well now, Miss Pratt said, when Harriet had scurried away with that candle, what's in your mind, Mud? You look that vexed, you do. For with Harry's departure, Maud's face had gone dark. It's Amelia, said Maud. What about Amelia? Miss Pratt asked. Lawrence, Maud said, cupping his mug. Marston footman. Mrs. Pratt felt the stirrings of a deep foreboding. How do you know this? She told me. He gave her a direct look and softened his tone. Steal yourself, Mrs. P. There's been a killing. Mrs. Pratt felt her heart lurch in her chest. A killing? She whispered, scarcely able to comprehend. A killing. But before Maud could elaborate, there came a loud knock at the kitchen door. Mrs. Pratt, still in a state of stunned shock, got to her feet, groped her way to the door, and opened it. On the doorstep before her, as if summoned by Maud's awful revelation, stood none other than Constable Lakin. Mrs. Pratt felt she knew the constable well, for she had once spent a night in his gaol and a good part of the next morning answering his impertinent questions pertaining to the death of the elder Miss Ardley and her sister Mrs. Jaggers. But she had long since excused that impertinence. The constable had only been doing his duty then, and as he was clearly now. "'You've come for Amelia,' Mrs. Pratt said low. "'Yes,' the constable said. He stepped inside. You know, then. Mrs. Pratt closed the door. The worst, she replied. Automatically, she went to the teapot, filled the mug, and handed it to the constable. He pulled a chair forward to the fire, warming his hands. Poor Lawrence, Mrs. Pratt said, shaking her head. She had only seen the man a time or two. Handsome he was, with a quick tongue. Little good his looks or his tongue would do him now. Yes, the constable said. It is very difficult for him, too, you understand. Mrs. Pratt say da sat down. I'd say, she said. She knew the constable to be a man of understatement, but this was remarkable even for him. What'll happen now? I'll need to talk to Amelia, of course, the constable said. Is she here? I'll fetch her, Maud volunteered, and left the room. Will you arrest her tonight? Mrs. Pratt asked fearfully, thinking of the cold, dark gowl, and wondering how she was ever going to break the news to her dear sister Rose, who had not yet recovered from sweet Jenny's death. And to Miss Ardley, that such a thing should happen when she, Sarah Pratt, was alone with the household in charge of the staff responsible for her niece's behaviour. Mrs. Pratt felt as if she herself had done the unspeakable deed. No, the constable said, I won't arrest her at all. Mrs. Pratt, moral indignation, fled. Not at all, she cried, her heart swelling for the, wick, for the victim. Why, ma why, man, a murder has been done. Where's your sense of justice? Twa if twa my own daughter killed Lawrence, I'd have you arrest her. It wasn't Lawrence who was killed, the constable said. Where'd you get that idea? He looked into his cup. It was Sergeant Oliver, the constable from Gallows Green. Sergeant Oliver? 
Mrs. Pratt threw her apron over her head, her dismay unbounded. Dear God, and him with a wife and babe, how could she? How could she? I hardly think that Amelia is all that much to blame, the constable said mildly. All she did was go larking with Lawrence. They stumbled on Oliver's body when they went through, the, through a hedge on Lamb's Lane. Mrs. Pratt do dropped her apron and stared at him. She didn't? But a question was interrupted by the appearance of Mud and the Ash in Amelia, a fact for which Mrs. Pratt would be forever grateful. She would hate to admit to the constable, Omar, or most especially to Amelia, that she had for even one instant considered her niece capable of murder. By the time the constable had finished questioning Amelia, Mrs. Pratt had fully recovered herself. After showing the constable out, she closed the door and whirled on the girl in full fury. The lane, she cried, and what were you doing, my fine girl, skulking in the lane with the footman? Ten minutes later, a contrite Amelia crept out of the kitchen, and Mrs. Pratt, feeling that her duty to her sister, to her mistress, and to God had been fully discharged, went on to the cupboard and uncorked the cooking wine.